Good morning, everyone. You've probably heard this before, but it is so quiet during the summer, and so we get really excited when you're all back. So welcome back. We're glad you're here. Go ahead and pray with me this morning. Lord God, our hope, as we thought about this time together, our hope has been that we would have an opportunity to think about what it's like to be with you here in this space of Calvary Chapel. Lord, and also that we would all have some space to consider what our life might be like with you this semester, to kind of plan and think through the places that you're calling us to be and to worship uh, as we desire to grow with you and abide with you this semester. And so, Lord, we give you this time. We ask that your spirit would be at work. And God, I ask that your spirit would speak to each of us um, because you know where we're at. You know our unique stories, and you know exactly what we need. So thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, in John 15, we get a chance to listen in on Jesus' conversation with his disciples. It was the Thursday before Good Friday, and Jesus knew that his time with his disciples was short. They had already spent three years together, and it had kind of been an intense three years. They had witnessed healings. They'd seen people rise from the dead. They saw 5,000 people be fed with two loaves and a couple fish. They were experiencing tons of crowds following them everywhere they went, threats from religious authorities, so it had been pretty intense for them. But on this night before Jesus was going to die, he knew that life was gonna get even more intense. And so given this context, it's worth it for us to pay attention to the last few words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. So I'm gonna read to you from John 15, starting at verse one. Jesus says to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. In these first nine verses, Jesus uses the word abide 10 times. 10 times he's encouraging his disciples to abide. He's pretty serious about it. Well, when I was uh, first a student at Talbot, uh, I learned that a well-researched and well-documented trend among seminary students, students who were studying to be pastors and Bible teachers and who wanted to minister the word of God to the people, was that their prayer life tanked. I have experienced firsthand this very real temptation for my life to become so consumed with knowledge about God, with theology and languages and hermeneutics and church history and systematics and proper exegesis, that I can easily mistake my knowledge about God for my life with God. Well, in our time here, we have seen similar trends among you undergraduate students here at Biola. You are sitting in 30 units of Bible classes in major classes that integrate Christian thought into your subject and encourage you to think biblically about everything, in Bible studies with your leadership group or ministry group or small group, in chapels that have pretty amazing speakers. You may have regular experiences of your mind being blown with knowledge about God. And this is incredible. You are learning so much and yet we regularly come across students who wonder what has happened to their life with God. Why God seems so distant. Why life with him doesn't have that golden tinge that it used to. Why the spiritual feelings they once had seemed to have dis dissipated. I've met with students who are asking the question, why is it that I know so much about God? I know all the right Bible verses, I know all the right answers, but I'm regularly encountering this sin or this struggle, this addiction or character flaw or sin habit or anxiety or depression, and it just won't go away. I know so much about God, but this is still here. So many of you, if you haven't yet, you will. You've had this experience of your mind being blown by incredibly insightful thoughts and ideas about our God from learned and godly professors and mentors. And yet, 
here is that commonly reported Biola experience. My prayer life struggles while I'm here. And in fact, it might disappear altogether over summer vacation. My heart sometimes simply cannot engage. So here's the question. How do the insights that you have gained and will continue to gain here at Biola, how do those insights sink down into and transform the sinful places of your heart? How can these insights, this head knowledge, positively influence your prayer life, which really is the knowledge of the heart? How can knowledge about God lead to heart change? Well, this is our big question. Thanks, Lisa. As Lisa and Hillary mentioned, I'm Chad Miller. I'm the director of spiritual formation. And we get to ask big questions like that. I work with a team of people who are every day asking not what, but how. How might one change? And that's what we're really talking about. It is the how, not the what. You are here at Biola, and my bet is that some vision for where you should be spiritually is already something that you carry with you. So I don't want to belabor that. I don't want to try to make sure that you know where you should be. I think you already know it. Many of you feel like you come here doing pretty well. Maybe it's like a sort of a, a business would assess itself and say, you know, the numbers are crunched and, you know, quiet time is up and uh, good deeds are up and things are looking pretty good. Others maybe are aware of an ideal vision for spiritual maturity due to the fact that you feel far from it. And man, the experience of coming back to Biola and seeing everybody, because everybody's looking like they're doing really good, don't they? Well, that just puts you into an awareness that you feel far from the ideal vision. For you, the, the quarterly report is in, sales are down. But for both scenarios, what's revealed is that most of us carry in our chests a sense of who we think we should be. Actual or imagined, we all measure ourselves against that spoken and often at Biola unspoken standard of Christian growth and spiritual maturity. And so with that in mind, I want to be careful, like I said, not to belabor the point. It takes almost no thought at all to know that prayer and worship and encouraging words and scripture reading are all evidence of Christian maturity. I don't need to convince you of what you're already convinced of. And the opposite is true too, that gossip, greed, lust, selfishness, listening to Justin Bieber are all marks <laughs> of hell on earth. <laughs> Come on, you know it's true. <laughs> For our purposes though, we already assume that most of you know the signs of Christian maturity. So describing what you should be is actually not what we're generally interested in. In spiritual development, we generally are asking the questions, how might one grow into the kind of person that we already know we need to be? Because that seems to be the actual mystery. What are the means that would get us there? We're captivated by knowledge of the process of spiritual growth, not describing spiritual arrival. So Lisa's question is a good one. How might one change? Well, I wanted to just transition and just sort of make an observation as part of this culture. Um, if you've been here even for a week at Biola, if this is like your first week, one of the things you may have noticed is that nobody uses a tray in the calf. <laughs> if you've taken my class, we've belabored this point quite a bit. If you've just come through SOS, there's a good chance you had an SOS leader who said, don't be a tray dork, right? Nobody uses trays. The funny thing I've noticed is that nobody really knows why we don't use trays. It's an automatic behavior that is deeply ingrained in this culture. Nobody knows why, we just don't. If you think about it, trays are actually pretty practical. You can get an entire plate full and then another plate full and then a salad and like three drinks if you want. Trey is practical. So why don't we use trays? I am a Biola alum, and I can report to you that several years ago, everybody used trays. We would stack multiple plates, multiple drinks, a cup of ice cream, everything. So it makes me wonder, what was the process of how we changed from being there to where we are now? 
We know the end results. We no longer use trays. Nobody be caught dead using a tray. I'm not concerned with where we ended up or arrived at as much as I'm curious about the process that led to that outcome. How did an entire community change? In about 2007, Bon Appetit, who is our catering company, concerned about the amount of food it was discarding, removed the trays for one week, hoping that students would take less food. After the week, Bon Appetit posted the numbers showing that the food wasted from one week had been drastically reduced. So now we have a piece of insight. Wow, insight. So something about these findings altered the students' awareness, and armed with this new insight, Biola set out on a new rhythm, no longer including trays at meals. Now, about six years later, not, not using a tray is a sign of belonging to this community. It's deeply internalized and automatic. We know we shouldn't waste food. That's the nugget of insight and wisdom. We don't want to waste food. But how do we make that become deeply internalized into our practice? Well, at Biola, armed with a new insight about food waste, we changed our rhythm. Something I want to just point out to you, and if you've been here for a while, you know this. Biola is a bit of an insight mill. There's a lot of insight here. But insight isn't wisdom until, it, until those insights carve out a new rhythm into our lives. Insights don't transform us unless they become lived out, regularly returned to spiritual rhythms. That becomes what Proverbs simply calls wisdom. Insight standing there frozen is not wisdom. Here's the thing about rhythms we live. Some rhythms produce waste, some rhythms produce life and wisdom. A small action here and there is not a big deal. But over time, those rhythms will change us. So in this room, and Lisa's gonna talk about this room now, but in this room, we offer rhythmic opportunities that lead to that kind of change. In this room, we're gonna to return to similar sounding prayers that you may even start to memorize. You may not sense that your life is changing in a week. You walk out of those doors, you may feel like, ah, that was a rhythm, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm changed. But over time, regularly returning to those rhythms, you will see great strides. I want to invite Lisa back up, and she's going to talk to us about the uniqueness of this space. Thanks, Chad. Well, as Chad noted, some of the chapels that take place here tend to be a bit different than those in the gym. And part of that is simply because the room is different they lend themselves to different expressions of our life with God. So take a moment and notice what is different in here about than, it, than it from the gym. What are some things that are different? First of all, it's a lot quieter, right? Perhaps it's a little easier to focus in silence than in the gym. The gym kind of lends itself to more of the energy, energy and the, the passion that we have with God. Here, it's a little quieter, a little, a little more silent, doesn't echo. You might also notice you're a whole lot more comfortable in here. The chairs have backs, they're padded. Again, it's a little maybe easier to focus when there's not a lot going on up front. It's air conditioned, it's pretty nice, especially when Tori comes. It kind of even has this particular smell to it, kind of the old building smell, maybe a little bit like books. It feels a little more solid. In the gym, it's a little more sweaty, right? Basketball practice that morning. But again, that lends itself to maybe a little more energy, a little more action, um, which again can impact our experience with God. The building is actually shaped like a cross. So we're actually in the middle of Jesus' cross. And in fact, this building is a focal point on campus, right? You've seen pictures of it. It's kind of an icon for what Biola University stands for. It's a little bit different than the gym. There's a reverence fostered here in part because of the look and the feel of the place, because of the physical environment that we're in. And that's important, it's important to note that, pay attention to. Perhaps my favorite part of this space, though, are the stained glass windows. They, um, maybe they're open for interpretation, but when I look at them, I think of vines and branches that are bearing fruit. Well, we've been asking this question, how does insight or knowledge about God lead to change? And that stained glass window up there, which is, in my opinion, maybe a colorful rendering of John 15 and Jesus' encouragement to abide or remain in him, might kind of give us a clue to the answer to that. 
Now, again, Jesus' words were spoken on the night before he died from John 15. And possibly they were spoken where he had the last supper with his disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem. But you know, that week, that whole week, Jesus and his disciples were not actually staying in Jerusalem. They were staying out in Bethany with Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And so every day when they would come into Jerusalem, they would walk across the Mount of Olives where there are olive groves and grapevines. And so this image of vines would have been very clear in their minds because they had just walked by those vines that very day. And so then Jesus says, abide in me. He uses the things around him to teach his disciples lessons, to teach us lessons. I am the vine, you are the branches, and it is because of me that you bear fruit. Now, it takes a long time for grapevines to bear good quality fruit. It's a process. At a certain time each year, the vine dresser takes bits of branches in his hands and carefully cuts away the dead parts. Can't cut off too much or the branch will die. So he goes slowly and he's quite deliberate and skilled in what is to be pruned away and what's to stay. He takes his time to clear away the weeds. He prunes in such a way that will maximize the bounty and the sweetness of the crop. And after the pruning and clearing away of the weeds, um, he waits all winter and then all spring and into the summer. He waits for the fruit to bud and to grow and to sweeten, but it takes time, it's a process. Likewise, our transformation and our change is a process, it takes time. The Lord takes his time to carefully point out this or that about our character, about our sin, and then he slowly prunes it away when the time comes. But we don't often see the fruit of that. We don't often see the results overnight, right? One tray, as Chad mentioned, doesn't make much of a difference in the amount of food that is wasted. But in a single day, when there's like 6,000 people who flow through the cafeteria, wow, that makes a big difference. Over the course of of a year, as you're eating in the cafeteria, that one tray turns into two trays, to three, to four. That's what makes the difference over time. Change is a process, and it often feels very slow. The winter can sometimes seem so very long, and perhaps you're in that winter right now where things feel a bit dead. Perhaps some of you are in the spring where you're just starting to see what God is doing. Perhaps you are bearing full fruit right now and you're so excited about what God is doing in and through you. You might all be in different seasons. It's a process. But growth, growth happens as we abide, bit by bit, little by little, every day. Chad's going to come up and talk a little bit about some of the ways we in spiritual development invite you to engage with others this semester in the Biola community by abiding together in Christ in weekly rhythms of prayer. This building does have an old building smell. So some of you may have heard of Fives. Um, Fives is on Tuesday. There's a slide up there. So Fives is on Tuesday. And fives is a time where we gather at dusk to observe the prayerful rhythms of thanksgiving, confession, honest prayer, scripture meditation, and prayer for others. And these are rhythms that teach us to find God in all things as we learn to pray without ceasing. And again, this isn't a silver bullet. You don't come to this, do those things, and then leave here, and you are changed. However, we offer it as a rhythm. We offer it as a venue, a one-time venue, but realistically, it's offered as a rhythm to enter into. There's also Sabbathing um, three times a semester, September 28th, October 12th, and November 19th this semester. These are all extended times of solitude where we meet in here, we talk, we sort of set the stage, and then you go out and you spend that time with God abiding in the vine. This semester we're uh, really excited to be offering a new opportunity in here. Um, If you're a commuter by chance, uh, this might be a great opportunity for you because it's gonna be at noon. One of the, some of the feedback we wanted to respond to is that, man, the chapel times are kind of hard to get to. So we're going to have a, a, an opportunity in here called Midday uh, at noon. We're going to really just be joining with a great cloud of witnesses. This is spoken of in Hebrews. Who have for century gathered at midday, which they called sixth hour, for guided prayer and reflection, which in the midst of our workday grounds our identities in Christ. So we're going to be focusing on beauty 
and recalling our truest identities in Christ. I don't know if you've noticed in the first few days here at Biola, you get around all these people and your head starts to spin and your identity maybe gets away from you a bit. And all of a sudden you're entertaining all these ideas of who others may say you are. So midday is gonna be a rhythm, we present it to you as a rhythm, that you can come and sort of refocus on your truest identity, which is your deepest calling to abide in Christ. And so there's two other things that happen on Tuesday and Thursday, and Lisa's going to come up and talk about that. Of course, most of you know about Tuesday Talbot Chapels, sponsored by Talbot Seminary. And as usual, they will bring in um, scholars and this year a few more local pastors to teach us. And then Thursday Chapels, of course, many of you might know, is an opportunity for us to consider the diverse ways that God's kingdom is expressed among us. So multi-ethnic programs and development sponsors those, and we also have a handful of student uh, selected speakers. So please feel free to talk to Hillary if you have an idea of somebody that you'd love to see speak in chapel. Well, I want to make clear that this abiding that we're encouraging you to and that we hope to help support for you this semester in spiritual development, um, it's not in your own strength. Just before Jesus commanded the disciples to abide in me in John 15, he spends the whole of John 14 talking about the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit comes to help and to encourage and to guide. Um, and the encouragement really to abide is built on that foundation of the Holy Spirit. It's a very relational way of being with God because we have the Holy Spirit within us. So even as you're considering what you want your life with God to look like this semester, we want you to pray about it and to really sit with God and consider what he might be doing in your life. Each of you have, has had a different story this summer. Each of you has had a different experience. Your semester might be busy, it might be light. What do you think God is calling you to this semester? So with this in mind, we'd like to give you a couple minutes to consider that, to consider what God might be doing in your heart um, this semester. So what do you think you want your semester to look like? What are some of the rhythms or spiritual disciplines that he might be calling you to. Are there a couple chapels? You've, you've gotten this green brochure as you came in. Maybe there's a chapel or two that seem to be speaking to you in, in particular. What do you think those might be? So take a couple minutes and consider with God, what does he have for you this semester? Lord, in the silence, I'm reminded that even our simple act of turning our hearts towards you in this moment is something that brings you great delight. And that, Lord, even our taking a moment to turn our hearts to you brings a smile to your face, and that you say, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And Lord, you also know that as we enter into the semester, there are so many good things and so many temptations in our spiritual lives in this community. Lord, we learn so much about you here, and it is a privilege. But God, you also know that it becomes easy for us sometimes to neglect living life with you, to neglect abiding in you moment by moment. And so God, we thank you that there are reminders like chapels and classes and Bible studies and other regularly returned to rhythms that help train us and that you use to transform us so that we can bear fruit for you. Lord, be gracious to us, have mercy on us, as we engage in life with you this semester. Welcome us with open arms, and we know that you do. And we look forward to hearing you say welcome. Amen. Just as a reminder, the senior sojourn applications are up here for you if you're interested. But let me bless you before you go. So may the Lord bless you and keep you this semester as you walk out those doors and as you walk with him into your day. May he make his face shine upon you and give you his peace, knowing how very much he loves you and delights to call you his own. Amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.